Bonjour, merci d'être ici. C'est fantastique de voir trop plus people, peuple. As you might have noticed, I'm not a nat native French speaker, so I prefer to switch to English. I hope you can bear with me. Thanks for being here. Wonderful to see so many of you. Um, in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the magic world of transport layer security, or secure sockets layer, as it was formerly known. If there's any questions, please keep them. There will be some room for questions at the end. Now, first of all, who's ever seen stack traces like these? Like, you have a production problem, or maybe not even production. Okay, now the question is, what goes wrong? What's the cause of the problem? Can you tell from reading the stack trace? Yeah, yeah. If, if you know where to look for, then, then you can quite easily spot it. But the thing is, many people find these type of stack traces, especially when it comes to secure connections, pretty hard to understand um, and pretty hard to troubleshoot too. Um, but the thing is, um, we need to take care of this. It's hard to set up transport layer security in a correct way, but it's very crucial that you do it correctly. And it's also very crucial that you understand what you are doing and what is happening under the hood, the stuff that you do not see but that does work for you. Then why is that so important? Well, we're building more and more systems that work in a distributed way, systems that communicate with each other, um, and that might be in the very same computer or in the very same hypervisor or in the same data center, but there's definitely a trend going on of systems talking to each other across the world, across data centers, across public clouds, and all these connections need to be secured. These connections need to be, uh, to, to be able to trust upon the connection that no one will uh, intercept the traffic. Uh, if you take a look at the OC model, um, uh, w which you might have seen at school or something, then it says, okay, well, there's a presentation layer, it's the second layer from the top, and well, that, that layer is res responsible for data representation and encryption. And of course, you could do that. You could write encryption in your application, making sure that as soon as you, you start sending packages over a network wire or wireless, um, that that the content of the package will be encrypted. But you'll be doing the same thing over and over again. Every application that you're about to build needs to have its own encryption in it. And that's quite a lot of work. As I said earlier, it's hard to do it in a correct way. Um, and, and now what Transport Layer Security basically does is it moves the presentation from uh, the, the encryption from this presentation layer down to the transport layer, hence the name, Transport Layer Security. And because our application can trust the transport layer to be secured, it takes a whole lot of work out of our hands as application developers because we can just simply use a secured transport layer. Well, a brief history, because what is a presentation without a history of the topic? It all started with Secure Socket Layer 1.0, which was actually never released into the public. SSL 2.0 was in 1995, SSL 3.0 followed a year later, 1996, uh, but both were eventually found to be broken uh, by means of the Poodle attack. It took a few years in between, but the Poodle attack proved that both uh, mechanisms were not trustworthy anymore. In the meantime, TLS 1.0 was released, which is more or less the same as Secure Socket Layer 3.0, with a small minor modifications. Uh, but don't use that one either anymore because uh, the beast attack proved that it's vulnerable. So what's left is TLS 1.1 released in 2006 and as we know of, still uh, trustworthy, uh, and TLS 1.2 which was released in 2008. And there's a draft for TLS 1.3 but it's still not released. Yet there are sites, websites out in the wild that still use broken uh, protocols. I've heard just this day that Maven Central is one of them. And I've heard just this day that if you use old Java versions, you might be in trouble. But the details are not on me. So anyway, take care if, if you start doing this kind of stuff, that you use only um, uh, uh, schemes that are not yet um, broken, not yet uh, vulnerable. 
But first of all, let's, let's have a quick demo, because what's actually the stuff that we are worrying about? Well, here I have a packet sniffer running. Um, a packet sniffer is a very simple tool that just inspects your network card, and it will intercept packages on a specific interface. In this case, it's the loopback interface, because I, I do, I'll be doing the demos on my local machine. And here I'm going to access a very simple web server that's also running on my machine. It is, uh, as I said, very simple. I can use the curl command to access it. And it will give me the response of the web server. And if I give the minus V switch, it makes the output more verbose. And I can see what's happening. Uh, there apparently, the web server doesn't listen on IPv6, so it tries IPv4, gets a connection on localhost, sends some HTTP headers, gets back some HTTP headers and a response lorem, ipsum, and the rest of the text, which I always tend to forget. Now the thing is, if I have this package sniffer, there it is, I can see in plain text what was sent over the wire, get HTTP one, one line break, line break, and then data being sent back, HTTP 1.1.200, okay, line break, line break, lorem ipsum, and the rest. Now, for this web server, it's not a big deal because this is not sensitive, but imagine it was your bank. And imagine it was a web page that asked you to submit your login credentials. If I was able to somehow sniff your network, either because I'm in the same building, maybe I've set up a hotspot with the same name, maybe I've injected some malware on your computer, who knows what? I could just read along with your internet banking traffic. That's what we're talking about. People being able to read exactly what you send and receive to other systems. So, how could we prevent this? Well, as you might have figured, the, an the answer lays in transport layer security. Um, and, and what we basically need to know and understand are three things. First of all, we need to know a little bit about public-private key encryption. Secondly, we need to know about certificates and how we could sign a certificate. And finally, we need to know about certificate authorities. And we'll dive into each of these three topics in the following time. So, to start with, public-private key encryption. Public-private key encryption is actually pretty hard stuff. That means if you have to implement it yourself. Many, uh, the, most of the people that work on these algorithms have a PhD in math, or maybe a PhD in math and also a PhD in another subject. These are really smart people, and I do not pretend that I can explain each and every detail to you, but I have found some diagrams that might help us, and they are in a language that we all understand. English, French, it doesn't really matter. I mean, who has never seen an IKEA diagram? So what's public-private key encryption all about? First of all, here we have a safe. And the safe has a lock, and that's a very special lock. Because the lock can go in one direction with this key, and it will go in the other direction with the other key. And these are not the same keys. Because this key, it has a globe on it. It's a public key. It's a key that I can give to each and every one of you, and I don't have to worry about my own security as long as I keep this key with my face on it to myself and no one else. That's the private key. And as we can see in, in the lower part of the diagram, the person with the head can safely distribute his public key to each and every one in the world as long as he keeps the private key to himself. Now, how does this work? Imagine we have a letter. Suppose it's a love letter or something. And here's someone who wants to send the love letter to the person with the hat. Well, first of all, he will put the letter in the safe, the special safe that we just saw. And he will use the public key with the globe on it to lock the safe. The safe is now locked. No one else can open it. And the lock can be distributed, for example, by truck, because it's a very reliable transport mechanism, as long as there are no strikes. Um, and then, if the truck delivers the safe, the person with the hat is the only one who is able to open the lock because he is the only one who has the private key, the key with, the, with his face on it. 
He'll open the safe, he'll find a letter inside, see it's a love letter, and well, they all live happily ever after. This is basically how it works. You might say, well, this is not how computers work, and you're definitely right. So we go one step deeper. And for that, we do need a little bit of math. And what we're about to see is, in rough lines, how the RSA algorithm works. It starts with selecting two prime numbers. Let's call them P and Q, and for this example, I've picked 11 and 17. And we calculate the modulo of P and Q by just multiplying them, which gives us 187. Now, the next step is that we select some kind of a random number. The random number needs to be between 0 and the modulo that we've just calculated. Let's, uh, let's name it E, and let's, well, it's a random number, so we could have taken anything. Uh, we could have taken 42, because that's a brilliant uh, random number, but in this case, I've chosen 3. And now the question is, can you please find me a value D for which this equation holds? d multiplied with e minus 1, modulo p minus 1 multiplied with q minus 1, needs to be 0. Well, you don't need a lot of calculating power to do this. You could even do a trial and error approach, and you might quite easily find that. You can so also solve it in a, a mathematical way, where you would say, OK, well, both sides of the equation sh should still hold. So let's see uh, the, the part uh, d times e minus 1. Um, modulo 160, that, that's 0. How do we know these values? Well, we know, of course, uh, P and we know Q. Um, so we can fill it in. 321 minus 1, modulo 10 times 16. 10 times 60 is 160. 321 minus 1 is 320. And we can navigate all back and finally solve for D is 107. Well, that's great. So far, so good. But the thing is that every time I select a new random number, I'll get another value for d, obviously. For example, if I would say that e is 75, d changes to 183. Okay, good. Now, another question. If I do not tell you what p and q are, can we still do this mathematic exercise? Here we know what P and Q are. They are, uh, I mean, we know what P multiplied with Q is. That's 300 minus 1. And we have E, which is 5. That's the random number. It's somewhere between 0 and P times Q. Now, again, the question, can you please find me a D for which the same equation as previously holds? Well, you might need quite a lot of calculation power, but it, this is pretty hard. If you do not know P and Q, the only thing you can do is guess. And that, that's like real guessing, because you do need to make an assumption about P and Q. Which two prime numbers are multiplied together equal to 299? And you can imagine that as the, the modulo grows and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, there are more and more combinations of P and Q prime numbers that might yield the same result. It's becomes harder and harder to find them. Again, if I can fill in P and Q, it's pretty easy. It's the same equation as we did a few minutes ago. But if we do not know them, it's pretty hard. And that's close to impossible, given the current state of what calculating power is. So if P and Q are big enough prime numbers, we can multiply them. and if you do not know them later on, it will cost you almost an eternity to find them back. And that's a very interesting property of these two numbers. Because that means that we can distribute P and Q to each and every one in the world. We could even distribute this random number E somewhere between 0 and P times Q. And we would still be safe because we are the only one who know P and Q. The individual values for P and Q are our private key. And as long as we keep them to ourselves, it will cost somebody else almost an eternity to find them. And almost an eternity is a lot of time, and most attackers do not have that time nor the patience to wait for that. So how does that work in practice? Let's encrypt, for example, the letter G. 
Um, and let's just assume that G equals the value of 7. Uh, P times Q is 187, as we've seen before. E is 3. What we can do is we can take 7, the letter G, to the power of E, the value 3. So that's 7 to the third power equals 343. And then we calculate 343 modulo 187, which is P times Q. And we find that it's the value of 156. Now, on the other side, we receive this encrypted message. And oh, well, I'm curious what would be inside it. Um, but we have P and Q separately available. So we can calculate what D is using the equation that we saw earlier. And now what we can do, we can calculate 156 to the power of D, which is 156 to the power of 107, which is a pretty big number. It's 4 times 6 with 200 zeros behind it, somewhere around that. My MacBook couldn't calculate that, by the way. So your phone may probably not be able either. But trust me on this one, it's, it's, it's around 4 times 6 and 200 zeros behind it. Um, and then again, we'll take that value, modulo 187, and guess what? The outcome is 7. And 7 is the letter G. That's the, the, the encoding that we have, have selected using before. So now we have decrypted this ultra-secret message, 156, and we found out that the message is just a plain G. This looks more like fairy tales, and we have definitely no time for fairy tales yet. So, knowing how public and private key encryption works, we can start negotiating a secure connection using some other um, entity, uh, maybe in the same data center, maybe in a cloud uh, at the other side of the world. Um, and it involves quite some steps. The main steps are these. The client starts by saying hello to the server, and the server responds with hello. It's not just hello, it's hello. Oh, and by the way, this is the, um, the TLS version that I support. I have some, some algorithms that I would like to use. Uh, I have some compression methods that I would like to use. Is there anything that you, dear server, are willing to accept? And the server will reply like, OK, if you uh, understand these encryption methods, I'll pick this one. If you understand these uh, compression methods, I'll pick that one. Uh, and that's how they negotiate about the protocols. The server will also send a certificate. And in the next section, we'll see what a certificate really is. But let's just assume he sends a certificate. And he performs a server key exchange where he says that um, uh, what, what his uh, keys are, the, the, the public part of the key that is, of course, because that's the part that you can easily distribute. Now the hello phase is done. And the client will uh, reply saying, OK, well, uh, I've, I've created some, some keys for you. Um, these are temporary key keys, um, but it's not the key itself. It's some pre-master secret. So the client sends a pre-master secret to the server, and both will calculate the secret, which is like an in-between key, in fact, and use that for the rest of the connection. Because that's way cheaper than doing the public-private key encryption each and every time again. But because you did this one time and you'll select another pre-master secret the next time, it's very hard to, to interfere there. And then uh, the client says, OK, change cipher spec. From now on, everything I will tell you is encrypted and compressed using the, the, the algorithms that we've just negotiated. I'm done by now. And then the server will, will reply in a similar way, saying, OK, got it, everything from now on will be encrypted and compressed. Uh, and from then on, no one else will be able to intercept the traffic. Done. So what does that look like in practice? Time for another demo. Let me clear that one. There's another web server, and it has the same very interesting um, content, of course, lorem ipsum and the rest. And what we see here is a lot of um, output on the network. Let's look, yeah, there's the blank section. So let's start here. There's a lot of traffic going on, but there's nothing here that you can, as a human, can see and understand. There's nothing that you can read and say, OK, yes, this is, this is where Lorem Ips Ipsum and the rest was said, or this is where the GET request was being done. 
So what we have achieved by now is that we have a means by which two, uh, two entities, two processes, can communicate with each other in a secure way without somebody else who sits in between being able to actually intercept the traffic. Yeah. Well, what we can also do, if we want to troubleshoot what, what's going on, we can use another command, which is the OpenSSL as client. OpenSSL is like a standard toolkit for doing stuff related to both SSL and TLS, and the S-Client is just a simple socket client where I could say connect to um, local host on port 9001, uh, show me all the certificates that are being used in the process, um, and for SNI purposes send a server name along. Now as we can see, Here, the certificate is being sent and we can inspect which certificate it is, by whom it was signed, if it would have been signed, but this is a self-signed certificate, so it's not very interesting. We can see to whom it is issued, well, it's me, uh, and here's the, the certificate itself. That's what the server sent us. Oh, and by the way, no client certificate CA names were sent. Now, what, what this tells us is okay, the server has some kind of a certificate, which one is it, and can we see if it's the one that we expect, for example, which can be very uh, useful when troubleshooting connections um, to, uh, to other parts in your organization or maybe to, to uh, systems living somewhere on the internet, where your system says, well, I can't build a trusted connection. Then your first step could be, OpenSSL as client, let's see which certificate does it actually use. Is it the certificate that I expect? And then the next step would be why does my program not accept that certificate? But we'll get to that one later. So, no one's eavesdropping and we can be uh, sure that we have a trustworthy connection at this moment. Great. But the next thing that we need is signed certificates. Now, what's a certificate? A certificate is basically a small document that says that the, the holder of the document has or is something. I have a certificate in my, in my uh, wallet which says I have a driver's license. My driver's license is, in fact, some kind of a certificate because it says I have the right to drive a car. It's as simple as that. Now, in the digital world, it becomes a little bit more complicated. It's not a small, pinky-like plastic card, uh, but instead it's a, a digital document uh, with a serial number, which is easy for identification, subject, uh, uh, identification purposes. It has a subject, so that's to whom is this issued. It has some kind of validity. It might expire at some time in the future or in the past. There's a usage section, which says this, cer this certificate can be used for the following purposes. Very important in there is it has the public key, the public key that belongs to the private key, but just the public key is in there. And it has a fingerprint, which you can use to check that the certificate is not tampered with. And to hold, uh, to make it useful, there's also a field that says how the fingerprint was calculated. So it's just an integrity check, basically. Um, but as we just saw, anyone can create a certificate. I can create a certificate myself on my own machine, and that would be a self-signed certificate. Uh, that gives the suggestion that maybe there's also certificates who are not self-signed, and indeed you can also have certificates signed by somebody else. By me, for example, but that doesn't help you very much. So what we also need in this certificate is a signature an algorithm that describes how the signature was calculated, and a reference to whom actually signed the certificate. Fair enough. And, very important, we need a way to calculate a digital signature. And now the good news is that calculating digital signatures is something that you can do with public and private keys. So here's again our friendly guy with the hat, um, 
at the top we have a document and the document needs to be signed. Um, as you can see, here's the guy with the hat, he has a private key and the, he puts the signed document into the safe and locks the safe, which basically says, okay, the document is now signed. Again, truck drives the safe to somebody else. That somebody else could be many people because the public key is used to verify the signature and the whole world can have the public key. So in this case, there's a lot of people. In fact, everyone who gets a document can verify that the signature was indeed the signature of this person because they can use the public key to open the safe. And as soon as the safe opens, they see the, the document. And by opening the safe, that means that yes, they have the right key. They have the, the, the public key that corresponds to the private key from the person who created the signature. Now imagine another scenario where there's a bad guy. He has one eye that doesn't work apparently, um, and he has another private key with his own face on it. Now, he tries the same trick. He's like, oh, okay, I can do this. I have a document, I put my signature on it, put it in the safe, and I'll just lock the safe. No one else will see the difference, will, will they? truck starts driving, then somebody else who receives the message uses the public key that belongs to this private key. And the lock doesn't open. And that's a, that's a sign to this person that the signature is not the signature that he or she expected it to be. Because in the, in the real digital world, it's not really like you open a lock and you get the document out of it. You just have the document. But the analogy is that if you use a specific public key to verify someone's signature and the signature was created by another key, it will not work. The signature will not be validated. Or to put it in a different way, a signature is a mathematical relationship and that, mat that relationship holds between a message, a private key and a public key the signature has two parts. It has a signing function and a verifying function. The signing function is what the owner of the private key does. He invokes the function and passes the private key and the message. And the output is some, f some kind of value T. Let's call that the signature. And then anyone who wants to, uh, to, to verify that the document was indeed signed by this person, can invoke the other part of the signature, the verifying function, passing along the message, the signature and the public key to the other function and that will give either accept or reject. And if it's reject, you can still read the document. But the thing is, you cannot be sure that it was created by the person who you expected it to create. So, the only thing we need to know if we want to validate if a document was signed correctly is the public key. And the one who created the signature is the one who needs the private key. Now, the last thing that we need to have in order for really secure communications is a certificate of authority. Because as I said, we can create certificates, we can create key pairs at the very first step, then we can create certificates saying, I, Martin, have this or this public key, and I also own the, the corresponding private key. But the, the, the last thing that we need to know is some kind of an authority, someone above me who says, yes, that's indeed right, that he has indeed access to these keys. So what's a certificate of authority? A certif certificate of authority is an entity, usually a commercial company, but not always, um, that creates a dig digital certificate for you. And that certificate certifies that you own a public key. And it's a certificate that's with your name on it. So it's, it's clear to each and every one who sees this, the certificate that it belongs to, for example, uh, you as a person or your web server or whatever it could be. So what actually happens here is that I meet someone and I don't know if I can trust this person. 
And now certificate authorities help us determining the trustworthiness of this unknown person. Because there at the top, that's me. And I know, know a guy named John. And I trust John. He's a cool guy. John knows Alice. And he trusts Alice because she's cool. And Alice happens to know this third person that I do not know, and I do not know whether I can trust him or her, but because I trust John, and John trusts Alice, and Alice trusts this unknown person, we have a chain of trust created. And I know that I can trust this unknown person. Sounds cool, but who is John in this story? If I would take a look on my MacBook, which I'm not going to do by now, but imagine you doing it, there's many of them. In fact, on a default Mac OS installation, you'll have around 160 Johns. Carefully selected by Apple. And I'm not saying whether you should trust Apple or not. You can make up that for yourself. The good news is, if you're, using a, if you're writing a Java program, you're running it on a JVM. And the JVM has its own uh, set of trusted certificates. It's more or less the same set. Again, some 160 Johns, and they're all trusted because Oracle selected them. And again, it's up to you if you want to trust Oracle. But the thing is, and, and, and you can see that from the number, th th this goes out of hand pretty quickly because who actually trusts them? I did not make a choice myself whether or not I should trust this company. Apple did. And by buying a, an Apple device, I somehow put my trust in Apple, apparently. But the good news is, in this whole story, all is not lost, certificate authorities, these are serious companies. I mean, they make a lot of money, that's, sh that's for sure, but they do a lot of good stuff for that as well. They have top-notch security procedures. And one of the most important ones they have are their key ceremonies. A key ceremony is a ceremony by which the certificate authority will interact with its own keys. So its own private key. And you can imagine that's an important asset because they use that to sign other certificates which are used to sign other certificates, which are used to sign other certificates. So if you would have access to that private key, well, that's a valuable asset. But they have ceremonies for this. So if, for example, the keypad needs to be replaced or updated or it needs to be used in order to create a new intermediate certificate, they'll have procedures for that. I've seen one of these procedures. It's a document of, I think, 160 pages or something describing in very much detail each and every step that needs to be performed. Opening a safe notary being there to verify that the save was indeed not tampered with, selecting people from the company who need to attend, who need to have a copy of the ceremony document and, and check mark each and every step, and need to write down each and every derivation of the process. And they'll even select random people from the company or maybe even from other companies, just to make sure that if I would like to tamper with the procedure, well, there's always one or two random people that I did not know in advance they would be there, and they'll be watching it. There'll be cameras installed all over the room, eight cameras, and they'll record the whole process, which can take six to eight to 10 hours. And they'll dump it all online so that each and every one can see what happened and that they followed their own procedures correctly. Well, that definitely gives me a trustworthy feeling, but still. There is time left for some fairy tale. Thank heavens. This is the beautiful town of Beverwijk. It's a small town in the Netherlands where I come from. I've never been in Beverwijk though. It's located a bit above Amsterdam for those who wonder. And here in Beverwijk, there was a, a notary. And this notary saw that there was a lot of buzz around digital certificates. Hmm, well, I can do that because that looks like what I do every day. So they decided to become a certificate authority and they called it DigiNota. And that all worked out fine. They made a lot of money. But on one day, things went bad because an attacker compromised one of their web services. 
Uh, the web server was running .NET Nuke software. I'm not saying .NET is wrong by default, but well, hey, that's for you to conclude. Um, version 4.8.2.0 uh, installed on one of their machines, the Windows RV 190, and there's a file upload vulnerability in this specific version of .NET Nuke. And due to the weak security of the Windows passwords on that specific machine, we must assume that this attacker, and we still don't know precisely who that was, could compromise the passwords of all accounts found on that system. And on that system, the domain admin account was also present because he once logged in there. And using those passwords, the attacker was able to traverse the infrastructure of DigiNotar. Machine by machine by machine, he traveled through that network to finally obtain access to at least two of the machines where certificates were being signed. I'll give you a second to think about what this means. This is not cool. If you're a certificate authority and this happens to you, you're in serious trouble. In fact, the company was declared bankrupt not very long after this. But let's see what happened. Google immediately blacklisted 247 certificates shipped with Chromium and Chrome because they were all signed by DigiNota. Microsoft removes DigiNota root certificate from all supported Windows releases. Mozilla revokes trust in DigiNota root certificate in all the supported versions, and Apple immediately uh, issued a security update. Oh, there's a tiny asterisk there. That must mean something. This Windows update was delayed for the Netherlands for at least two weeks by request of the Dutch government because they were one of DigiNotar's clients. And all certificates in use by the state of the Netherlands were directly or indirectly signed by DigiNotar. And they were afraid correctly, by the way, that as soon as Microsoft would roll out this specific update to the Netherlands, their whole IT infrastructure would collapse. And all clerks and everyone working for the government would not be able to do anything. So they ple pretty, pretty please asked Microsoft to withhold the update for two weeks. And Microsoft did that. But luckily, we have very good politicians in the Netherlands and the Minister of uh, Homeland Security said, people, people, no panic. Just look at the green check mark in your address bar. It's the best you can do, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. That's what he said. Just look at the green check mark and you'll be fine. That's exactly what you need not to do. Anyway, what happened in the end was that uh, the company who issued the DigiNotar uh, certificates uh, updated their certificate revocation lists. Certificate revocation lists are lists that are uh, issued by each certificate authority, and they contain a long list of all certificates that they have somehow revoked, for example, because of uh, key uh, compromised keys. The only disadvantage is that you typically download these lists over HTTP, not HTTPS. So if I am a man in the middle, maybe I can just zip out my own certificate because that should still be trusted. Anyway, that's what happens. So for a last time, time for a quick demo. Let's use uh, CURL again. We're in France, so let's go for Air France this time. It's always interesting. Okay, well, that was quite a lot of output. Well, we see we have a se secured connection. Uh, we can't read any part of it. That's the good stuff. But what's also very interesting to see is that we can use OpenSSL once again, use the S client, connect to uh, Air France FR. Um, server name Air France FR. FR and show its certificates, please. And here we see this whole chain of trust. Let's see, we'll start at the bottom. 
here's one certificate block, add trust external TDP network over there by Komodo. Komodo apparently lives in Greater Manchester area, so if I would like to, I could even call them and see if, if all things are okay. That was the intermediate certificate, and then here is a certificate issued to a company that lives in Valdoise, and it has a certain postal code, Roissy Charles de Gaulle, well, whatever. I suppose that's Air France's address. You know probably better than I do, but it seems valid to me. Um, so what we see here is the first certificate, certificate number one, is the certificate that was created by Air France itself. It was signed by an intermediate certificate issued by Komodo, which is eventually signed by the root certificate. And this is just because the key procedures, as I described them earlier, are so complex that if you need to do them every single time a client of, of yours calls you and says, oh, I need to have the certificate signed, could you please do that for me? You can't run your business. So what they typically do, they have an intermediate certificate which is updated every two or three or four years. That's when the key ceremony starts and the whole, whole documenting and logging and everything. And this intermediate certificate is then the one that's used to sign client certificates like in this time Air France's. So, it's time for a wrap-up already. We've seen quite a lot of tools and, and things passing along in the past uh, 30 minutes. Uh, first tool that I've been using a lot is CURL, command line tool. Uh, you can give minus V to have a verbose logging um, so that you can see, uh, for example, why a certificate is being refused or not. You can give minus K, use with care, um, if you want to um, override the certificates that your system trusts. This can be, for example, pretty useful if you're in an intra-company situation which has its own um, uh, certificate which is not signed externally but just used for internal purposes. The other tool that I've used quite a lot is OpenSSL using the socket client command show certs switch tells me it tells the tool to show all certificates that have been used. Server name is because oftentimes uh, web servers host many, many sites at the very same time, so I need to specify which one of them I want to have. And connect finally says, okay, I want to connect at a specific address and a specific port number. How do you apply this to your Java programs? Well, you need a couple of JVM switches if you want to do this. First of them is the Javax Net SSL Trust Store. And you can point it to a file on disk that is a trust store, a, a file which contains all certificates that you, as a developer or as an administrator, do trust. And you can secure this file with a password, and if you do that, you need to specify the trust store password as well. Same holds if you need, ever need to use client certificates. You put the client certificates and the corresponding keys in a key store not a trust store, but a key store, which works more or less the same way. You put keys and certificates in it, and you can lock it using a password. By the way, the file format is actually the same, and you could technically use the same file for that. There's nothing that withholds you from that, but maybe your administrator will be very sad if you do that. And finally, if you still can't make sense of what's going wrong, this is a very useful one. Use Java Genet Debug All, and you'll get a lot of output, like really a lot. But it will tell you each and everything that goes over the wire, and it will probably tell you more than you can ever understand. At least that's what holds for me. Now, the JDK comes with a key tool, which is a command line utility for managing key store files. Personally, I don't find it very convenient. I always use Portaclay, which is like a nice graphical user interface, which can do all the same stuff. But yeah, you can point and click around, which is, in my opinion, a lot easier than having to type 5,000 command line switches. That's all I had. I think there's time left for questions, but I'm not sure because my clock wasn't ticking. <laughs> so is there time for questions? <laughs> there's time for questions, but you have to shout. <laughs> yeah.
So when you use the OpenSSL client, uh, you specify a server name. Yeah. Why is that? Why do you need to specify the server name when connecting to the server? That's because um, oftentimes uh, a web server will host many, many websites at the same time. And the first thing that you do if you are doing transport layer security is first establishing a secure connection, and then you start talking HTTP. But in such a, such a situation, you need to specify the name of the server in the HTTP protocol, but you can't do that because you didn't establish a secure connection yet. But then how does the web server know which certificate to show to you? That's exactly why. So you give this extra switch to tell the web server, here's a preview of what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you at france.fr. So please give me the, the, the secure connection that, ho that belongs to that specific website. Does that answer the question? Perfect. But thank you. Is there any tool to make uh, Javanet uh, debug more readable? <laughs> By a human, I mean. Yeah, so am I. I'm human too, and I, I'm not aware of such a tool. Maybe it does exist, I'm not aware of it. So that's, that, that typically that's my very last resort because of its verbosity and its, its enormous amount of output. Hi, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, on one of your slides, you said that the certification authority certifies uh, the owner of the public key. Isn't shouldn't it be the private one? Um, technically, both, but the public key—that's the part that you, as a um, consumer, are interested in, usually. Um, and and since there's a math mathematical relationship between the two. If you are the owner of the public key, you are also the owner of the private key. Okay, thanks. But you can distribute it to each and every one. They can have the certificate, but they will fail to present. The co they will fail to perform the calculations that invoke the private key, and as such, there will never be a secure connection. Um, one more question: What do you do with TLS when you have a reverse proxy? Um, your reverse pro proxy needs to be aware of it. Um, and more uh, to that, if the connection is still secure. Yeah, yeah, that's an, that's an interesting one. Uh, if with reverse proxy, you mean, uh, for example, if you're at a large company, you have a web browser, and you you talk to the proxy, and the proxy talks to Google.com, for example. Is that what you mean exactly. with reverse? Yeah. Okay. That I don't know from heart. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, last questions. Hello. Um, I've heard that the default Java implementation of uh, SSL and TLS could be not that performant. Do you have any recommendation regarding framework to replace it? I've actually never heard that it might not be performant. Um, maybe it is. I'm, I'm not, not, not questioning that, but it, it's, I, I hear that for the first time, so I do not have any recommendations for alternative implementations, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, thanks. That was the last one, so merci pour votre attention. <laughs> <laughs>